People are still rolling in, but we'll get started. Hello and welcome to the sixth annual Humanitarian Open Street Map Summit, America's Block. Welcome back to those of us who joined for earlier sessions today. Uh, we're thrilled to have each and every one of you joining us today for what has been and will continue to be an amazing summit. In fact, this is our highly highest attended summit ever, and we're very excited that so many people from all over the world are able to join us. Um, again, please let us know where you're calling in from. So we have our mentee poll up and thumbs up if someone has already added your country. Uh, we have an amazing uh, lineup of speakers for you today. And our first keynote from Emily Jacoby from Digital Democracy uh, will be wonderful. But before diving in, we have a few quick housekeeping notes. First of all, a reminder for everyone, these will be recorded. So if you catch something and you want to see it again, um, or you can't be in both rooms at once, uh, go check the recordings. They will be online afterwards as well. We also want to shout out our sponsors for this year's summit. If I can get the next slide. Our sponsors, Esri, Facebook, Maxbox, uh, Mapbox, and Critigen, we're so grateful for their continuous support and commitment to the humanitarian mapping community. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Next slide, please. Can I get the next? Oh, there we go. Yep. And speaking of wonderful sponsors, we are thrilled to announce that Esri and Hot are partnering to offer a grant of five thousand dollars plus one spot to attend at pre and present at next year's summit, um, when we can hopefully all meet in person. This grant and spot at next year's summit will be awarded to an OSM community that meets the criteria listed on the screen right now, um, and includes contributing directly to community-led open data for humanitarian response and fostering recruitment, engagement, and retention of volunteers. So applications are now open through January 4th to any OSM community that fits those criteria and that attends at least one session for the summit today, like you're doing right now. Uh, for more information, please visit the wiki link you see on the slide or in the chat to your right. And one last thing, uh, some reminders, please do remember to tweet, Facebook, Instagram, us your photos, videos, reactions using the hashtag hot summit, all one word. Uh, we have a jam packed program for you today and there aren't any breaks scheduled. So Zoom fatigue is very, very real. Please feel free to get up, stretch, grab a snack, or to take a comfort or bio break. The summit is being recorded again, so you can always review the talks later. And a reminder, we are still doing our Goose Chase virtual scavenger hunt, and today is the last day, so get in those submissions, and the winner will be announced via social media following the summit. Finally, should you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us via a private message on Zoom or at summit at hotosm.org. And if you have any questions for the speakers today or you want to have a discussion, please feel free to drop that in the chat. The questions will be shared with the speakers or with one of the volunteers via doc and time permitting, we'll try to get to those answers. All right, let's get started with our keynote. Emily Jacoby is the executive director and founder of Digital Democracy. Emily. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Lily. I'm really honored to be here. Let me just get my screen sharing set up. Okay, so I have a tall order today, which is to talk about a topic um, of decolonizing mapping and specifically to share lessons that um, I and my team have learned from co-building mapping tools with indigenous peoples, um, our partners around the world, and to do that in 15 minutes. So I'm gonna do my best. Um, so yeah, as Lily said, I'm the founder and executive director of Digital Democracy. We are a US-based nonprofit with a global team. And our mission is to work in solidarity with marginalized communities to use technology to defend their rights. Most of our work has involved mapping over the past 12 years um, because it's such a powerful tool and our partners have used it for both human and environmental rights um, initiatives. Despite that, I wanna begin by saying that obviously this amount of time is not nearly enough to honor the topic of decolonizing mapping. And secondly, as a, a settler of European descent uh, in, on you know, indigenous land, anything and everything that I have learned is through a partnership and years of work with and at the request of indigenous peoples. So I'm speaking today, uh, not as an expert, 
but in the spirit of sharing what I'm learning and encouraging other non-Indigenous peoples in the HOT and OSM communities to continue our own processes of examining the ways that structural racism, white supremacy, and legacies of colonialism show up in ourselves, our work, and our maps, and in the spirit of all of us working to continue to dismantle that. So um, for me, decolonization is not a metaphor. It is really an important part of my life's work to work to return land to native peoples. And I believe that any conversation about mapping in general should begin with acknowledging the land where we are. Since we're virtual, um, I'm hoping you can all help me with this and post um, either here on you know, the, the chat, on the Zoom room or on Twitter or just to yourself and it, take a moment to acknowledge whose land you're on. So for me, I currently live in Washington, DC, and that means I'm on the land of the Nakachunk and Piscataway peoples. If you're not already aware of native land, it is an incredible resource, both a website and a mobile app. Um, if you can just you know, open up another browser if you want or do this later, go to native-land.ca. And if you don't already know, you know whose land you're on, you can find that out. And so in my acknowledgement, I want to acknowledge that I'm you know, currently sitting on the traditional lands of the Nakachunk and Piscataway peoples. I want to thank them for their stewardship of this land and the waters and acknowledge that despite centuries of genocide and erasure, the Piscataway people are still here. They're practicing their culture and tending their traditional life ways. Um, and so just Despite the time constraints, I want to take everybody to take just a moment and silently for yourselves, give thanks to the indigenous people who have tended the lands where you are today. All right, thank you. So the, the story I'm going to tell is in four parts, and we're going to start with the kind of worst part of it and hopefully end on a note of looking into kind of the questions and inquiry that can take us um, into a better place. Um, but I want to begin with, and feel free to, again, type this into the chat. How many of you have heard of the term, the doctrine of discovery? I'm just always curious to know how many folks have heard, heard about this. I myself have learned about it from indigenous activists and scholars. And the doctrine of discovery is really intricately tied in my opinion with the history of map, map making, particularly here in the Americas. So this is a map of the Americas in 1606. Uh, you know, I grew up seeing maps like this, um, and, and you know, they always had this sense of allure, like, oh, look, there, there are monsters in the in the ocean, and you know, the the land shapes aren't quite, you know, as specific as we, you know, know they are now with satellite imagery and so on. Um, and the problem with maps like this is that it's made by Europeans. Almost all the names on on it are by given by the Europeans who came to conquer it, and not the people native to the area. And I think maps like this owe a lot to what I'm going to talk about, which is the doctrine of discovery. So the doctrine of discovery is a name that indigenous scholars have given to a series of edicts written by you know, popes um, from the Vatican during the 15th century that proclaimed the concept of terra nullius or nobody's land. And that essentially gave the authorization to European quote unquote discoverers to invade what they consider non-Christian land. It's a principle that's used in international law to describe territory that can be acquired through occupation. And it began actually long before Columbus um, you know, sailed across the Atlantic. It began while Portuguese um, sailors were actually sailing along the coast of Africa. And in 1452, Pope Nicholas V authorized the Portuguese discoverers to capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans and other enemies of Christ to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and take away all their possessions and property. By this edict, non-Christian peoples you know, did not own the land where they lived, according to the Vatican. They were to be brought under the rule of European Christians who invaded their land. And then it went further. Um, the year after Columbus you know, first sailed across the Atlantic, Pope Alexander VI told the Spanish crown, we, by the authority of Almighty God, give to you and your heirs forever all islands and mainlands to be found, discovered, and to be discovered towards the west and south from the Arctic Pole to the Antarctic Pole, 
and we appoint you and your said heirs, lords of them with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction of every kind. The reason I'm sharing this is because this doctrine guided the entire European conquest of the Americas and US law still rests on the framework regarding land rights. Despite its devastating legacy, it has never been annulled and continues to be upheld by the Supreme Court to take land from indigenous people, such as in a 2005 decision where Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg actually cited it, to uphold a decision against the Oneida people of New York. It's obviously informed maps like this one. Um, you know, Mexico and the United States are both, you know, coming from the colonial legacies. Of, of European powers and the way that these lines sought to erase the existence of indigenous peoples. The maps that we're building upon and navigating today don't reflect the land as it once was, or even as it is, but how it has been perceived across the centuries through colonizing eyes. And I believe that by making these invisible rules more visible, we can make room for an expanded notion and concept of, of what mapping really is. So I'll just briefly go into some of the signs of hope that I'm seeing. Um, and there are many names for this. There's counter mapping, there's indigenous mapping, there's critical cartography, there's collective cartography, there's participatory mapping. Um, but all of these are stemming from similar places, which is how to actually you know, destabilize the way maps had been used to take and, and you know, return land and power to, um, to different people, not just indigenous people. Um, but there's a long history of maps all over the world, and they're not all paper um, or, you know, on a two-dimensional um, landscape. So these are a great example um, that the Decolonial Atlas shares of um, a, in Kalalat Nunat in Greenland, Inuit people um, would carve portable maps made of driftwood that they could use while sailing. You can even, you know, these maps are amazing because they are, you can read them at night, you can drop them in the water and they'll still, they'll still work, they float um, and they help, you know, they help the sailors navigate, you know, these really small little inlets and islands. Another example also from the Decolonial Atlas is the what might be familiar to many of you, the Great Lakes, um, but on a map that's oriented towards the east, um, honoring traditional Ashinaabe culture um, and with traditional names um, rather than the new names that have emerged through colonization. Another example um, is from Emergence Magazine, a story of counter mapping um, that Jim Anote, a traditional Zuni farmer, is doing. Um, with local artists and, and people and really working not only to represent the landscape, but honoring sacred places and prayers. And then obviously, you know, the humanitarian open street map community has been an amazing example of counter mapping and getting many people involved, you know, across regions, uh, languages, time zones, etc, to work on, you know, whether it's disaster response, supporting refugees, you know, gender issues and so on. And I personally saw this when digital democracy was working in Haiti. Um, after the earthquake, it was incredible to see first the way that international volunteers supported mapping Port-au-Prince in a way that would actually help rescue people during the earthquake, but then how that later turned into, you know, the, the actually Haitian-led um, team members who were learning, who were learning mapping skills and able to apply it to community redevelopment pro um, projects. And then of course, you know, projects like Map Cabera that we'll be hearing about more today. So I want to share a specific story of two of our partners, um, Allianz Sabo and Amazon Frontlines, and specifically the Warani people um, you know, who work with both these groups as well as ours, um, who invited us to support a mapping initiative of theirs starting five years ago, um, 2015. So this is um, kind of an official map of Warani territory. And um, what's most striking to me is how blank it looks, which is also, I think, the way the Ecuadorian government has traditionally seen it. It's just empty, uh, you know, rainforest, no roads, um, you know, no roads going in, few oil pipelines along the edges. And um, to the Ecuadorian government, which is coming from this uh, concept of terra nullius, um, you know, it is land that can be exploited for oil or timber or other things. And so um, the Warani communities came to us and said, we want to create maps um, of things that don't have a price, because right now the government just sees our land as something that can be exploited. And we want to tell the real story and the richness of our land. And so we started with paper mapping, a participatory mapping process. This is my friend Namante. 
and um, went from community to community. We just did the initial training with the first community and trained a group of trainers. And then they went on and, you know, in their own languages, were doing these workshops where elders and young people were all coming together to say what they wanted to have mapped. Uh, they were taking GPS points. And then we ended up actually forking OSM's ID editor to, to make um, an easy to use what, what we call at the time Mapeo Sabo and has evolved into a whole tool uh, called Mapeo that made it really simple and easy for them, you know, even in these remote areas to sit down with a laptop, project it on the screen and have the whole community take part in mapping what was important to them. They were then able to you know, print off new, new uh, paper versions, edit them, create their own icons, and then you know, create finished maps that really, you know, in contrast to those empty government maps, show the full richness of their relationship with their territory. Um, the pride that they had you know, in like, then printing final maps and having them was just so evident. And this is an elder, uh, Dika, who told me, the map will speak to the world and show all the life that we want to protect and which others have to respect. We can show the map to our neighbors. This is a map like a story I can tell my grandchildren. Though they will know through it, they will know the work that I have done. So that was really an incredible process. And then all of a sudden in 2018, the government of um, Ecuador announced a new round of oil blocks. And uh, here at block 22, um, at the you know, top part of the map, is on the western part of Warani territory, exactly where we had been creating these maps. So we ended up creating a website, um, an interactive map that we helped them launch to tell their story. They launched a legal campaign. That's Namante, who was leading one of those first workshops a few years later, leading being one of the, the primary um, defendants in this legal case. And then they actually won the legal case and were able to protect half a million acres of their territory. And they talk about how the maps played a crucial role. And I think this is actually a really important point for, for the hot community. It wasn't just the final maps that they used in the court case, which did play a crucial role in helping to convince the judge. It was actually the process of mapping and the way that they worked together on the maps that gave them the unity to actually make like take that case to court. And I think that's really relevant um, as we as we think about as OSM thinks about it hot thinks about you know how you're engaging with a broader community, um, and then you know the coda on that story is that uh, Namante and the Warani people were just named the one of the 2020 Goldman Environmental Prize winners. Um, it was really incredible to to have been accompanied and you know a small part of that process um, as it has stood. So. I just want to end uh, with with a few lessons and questions, and you know it's kind of ironic because OSM and ID editor and the work of Hot has been you know really influential in our work, and as as I said, Matt Bayo, which the Morani used so effectively, was really you know taking taking OpenStreetMaps ID editor and applying it in a place where there are no there are no roads, um, so. I want to first just say a quote from Opie, um, who, was, who was the director of the Warani Mapping Project and actually Namante's sister. And he told us, technology won't save our land. We have to save our land. So we always try to remember, even as people are using technology, what they're using it for. And so some of the questions on my mind, what would an open street map look like in parts of the Amazon where there are more rivers than roads? This is actually um, you know, OSM data on Iquitos, a city that we've worked in um, quite a bit in, in the outlying areas of Northern Peru. And Iquitos is the largest city in the world that doesn't have roads going in or out. As you can see, there's just one road. It goes to a small village of Nauta um, upstream and there's no roads otherwise in or out. You can only get to Iquitos on rivers or you know, flying over air. Um, what about what you know? What does open street map mean for communities where the rivers change course every rainy season, or where a new road likely may, means a new wave of colonization and resource extraction? Going back for a moment, what color are the rivers on open street map? Okay, they're blue. What color is this river? Opie told us our rivers are not blue, they are black, they're coffee colored, they're clear or they're milky. There's probably not a single blue river in the whole of the Amazon. In the end, you know, going back to those Warani maps, they did decide to keep the rivers blue. Um, that's because they specifically knew they had to convince an outside audience why their, why their um, forests were so valuable and needed to not be destroyed by oil contamination, oil drilling. 
but that was a decision that they made to kind of have to meld their worldview with an outsider worldview. And I think it highlights some of the ways that our own internal biases can prevent us from seeing what is truly there. Um, Tyler, when Tyler asked me to speak, he invited me to specifically address, uh, address the Audacious Project. And I think the awareness that I've really seen in the hot community that to do it right, you need to address fundamental questions of equity and participation. I know this is a community working to do a better job of acknowledging past failures and talking openly about them in order to try to address them. Um, in that spirit here, are just a few of the final questions I'll, I'll share. So in terms of permissions, you know, there's questions of who owns the data and who decides. I think the beauty of OSM is that it was created by a group of volunteers for a purpose, but because they made that data open and the software open source, it has been adapted and adopted for so many other purposes, including the way we've used MapAO. But that doesn't mean it's gonna work for everyone. And I anticipate over that over the next five years, OSM will best serve the greatest number of people when it can interoperate with other data sets, such as indigenous mapping data that may need to be private for very important reasons. You know, there's a lot of aspects of indigenous um, mapping that need to be internal to the community and then can be decided to share outward. And that's some of what we've been able to do with MapBeo. Um, I also was thinking about what does it mean to be a place that's experiencing poverty? You know, how will those communities describe themselves? How do they want to be mapped? And who's going to do the mapping? I know these are questions you all are grappling with. I don't know the answers, and I don't expect any of you to know all the answers either, but I believe that answering them is a process that begins by having the courage to ask the questions in the first place, to ask them together, and to bring more people into that conversation. So I think I've hit my time. I will just say, uh, as the Warani would say, wapuni or thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be connected to this community and we look forward to continuing to interact and support each other. Um, you can check out MapBeo, um, which as I said, you know, has a lot of links with, with OSM while being distinct, um, as well as a new initiative we've, um, we're launching called Earth Defenders Toolkit that we also hope can really connect with um, the humanitarian open street map community. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily, uh, for bringing up such wonderful questions about settler colonialism and what equity will mean going forward. It's always great to question all the different realities that we see on one map. Um, moving on for the